From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. Today we wrap up our series on big tobacco and the whistleblowers and lawyers who fought to hold the industry accountable. For decades, the tobacco industry lied to the public about the harms of smoking. Millions of Americans became addicted to cigarettes, and millions died as a result of this dangerous habit. Even today, despite a sea change in the country's attitude towards cigarettes, hundreds of thousands of Americans die every year from smoking. And over 16 million Americans have a disease that's caused by smoking. How has the tobacco industry managed to get so many people hooked on such a dangerous product? And how have they gotten away with it for so long? Today, I'm joined by Anise Kim, a public health expert who's currently studying the ways in which tobacco and e-cigarette companies use social media to sell their products. Kim is a senior scientist at RTI International Center for Health Policy Science and Tobacco Research. In her work, she's found that the industry is drawing from an old playbook in order to get a new generation hooked on nicotine. Here's our conversation. American Scandal is sponsored by the new Audible original Bad Republican by Meghan McCain. In her debut audio memoir, Meghan McCain gives a first-hand look into the life of the conservative rebel and departing co-host of The View. You'll hear what it's like to grow up as the daughter of an American icon and to mourn his loss very publicly just one year into her tenure as co-host of America's most-watched daytime talk show. Her memoir also reveals how she handled attacks from the U.S. president and her thoughts on cancel culture, dating, and how our country treats new mothers. It's unsparingly honest, deeply relatable, and highly entertaining. Go beyond what you know about Meghan McCain from TV and your newsfeed. Visit audible.com slash bad Republican and listen now. We get support from the new podcast, Hemingway's Picasso. Stephen Coe lived many lives. He was an NFL journeyman, a male model, and one of the most well-connected smugglers in 1980s Miami. Coe collected many souvenirs from his adventures, but his most treasured bounty, a beautiful ceramic crafted by Pablo Picasso and gifted to Ernest Hemingway at the author's Cuban home. So the story goes. Lost during the Cuban Revolution, the artwork resurfaced when Coe took it as payment for a drug run financed by the notorious Pablo Escobar. Coe passed away in 2018, passing the piece down to his son, Stevie. Stevie feels he needs to complete his father's mission of selling this piece and telling Steve's cinematic life story. Is the Picasso authentic or a fraud? Was Steve Coe a big talker or a real deal smuggler? Listen to new episodes of Hemingway's Picasso every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Anise Kim, welcome to American Scandal. Thanks, Lindsay. Happy to be here. So tobacco has been with Americans since well before the nation's founding. The growing, processing, selling of tobacco became a huge industry with deep pockets and a ferocious reputation for never losing a fight in court. Our series took a look at some of the first victories against them in the 1990s. But I was wondering if you could set the table for us with a quick history of the industry up until that time. Sure. I think up until that time, there was a heavy focus on marketing cigarette products largely to the public. And we know now, in retrospect, from some of the lawsuits and a very detailed analysis of the tobacco industry's internal documents, that the big tobacco companies were marketing their products specifically to certain populations, even despite the fact that there was some internal knowledge that tobacco products were harmful. And so a lot of the marketing that ensued in the early years really kind of set the stage for um, developing the general consumer's perceptions about cigarettes and getting generations really hooked on a very addictive product. This marketing was obviously effective. Millions of Americans took up smoking and continued smoking even when public perception of its health risks continued. But the, the tobacco industry was effective in staving off most legal consequences with a resilient defense of personal responsibility. The choice to smoke, they said, was up to the people who bought the cigarettes and certainly not the makers of the product. On its face, that, that seems reasonable. So why did many feel that that argument was deceptive? Yeah, I mean, I think with any products that get marketed into our world and our society, there's a sense that ultimately it's about individual choice. And so what the tobacco companies did was they essentially created a desire for a product. And they did that effectively through marketing. They, in the very early years, employed physicians and doctors who gave credibility to the product, and they were very explicitly positioned in the advertising. And then they also started to use models that really kind of glamorized smoking. They targeted women, they targeted racial ethnic groups. Um, and really kind of like set the stage of creating the desire around that product. Now, marketing alone wasn't what they did. That's definitely what gets the most attention when we talk about, I think, big tobacco. But you have to also understand that there was an environment completely created to then feed that desire. So the tobacco industry engineered their products to make them more addictive, right? So we know that tobacco crops were genetically engineered to have two times more nicotine. They adjusted their cigarette design so that there was more nicotine that was delivered. And then there were all these chemical compounds um, like menthol and flavors like menthol that kind of dulled the harshness of a cigarette. So it made it easier for people to inhale that nicotine could travel faster 
faster to the brain. So they really kind of creatively engineered a product that was going to make people more addicted because it's nicotine in cigarette products that really kind of addicts users. And then on top of all that, what they did was they also made these products really available in your local communities. So it isn't enough just to put advertisements in magazines and TV and, and other kinds of media, but to make it readily available. So we know that the tobacco industry spends majority, nearly 90% of their advertising dollars every year on marketing tactics that really make cigarettes cheaper and prominently displayed at the point of sale. And so it's really this kind of confluence of all of these various activities that really would suggest that it's not an individual choice so much, but a carefully designed system to kind of hook users. Efforts made to make cigarettes more addictive are obviously purposeful. You don't accidentally breed a tobacco plant with twice the nicotine. You don't accidentally add ammonia to increase nicotine uptake. And so this, this purposeful attention on nicotine indicates that the industry clearly knew nicotine was addictive. And yet throughout the history of the industry, tobacco companies have denied it, creating what could be called a, an alternative narrative of tobacco's benefits. How did this narrative shape the public's attitudes towards smoking? Yeah, I mean, I think early on they knew that there were probably going to be some doubts, right? I think there people were aware of things like the smoker's cough and had some potential concerns about the potential health risk. And so that's why I think when they started to kind of gain wind of that in the 1950s, if you look at some of the specific ads, they really kind of featured medical specialists and physicians and really tried to put credibility and some sort of science around this idea that um, tobacco products were not as harmful. And so the Stanford Tobacco website, they have such a wonderful repository of advertisements, of tobacco advertisements. And it's interesting, if you look through some of the ones from like the 1950s that feature physicians, there's ads that had these kind of taglines and information. I saw one where it said that medical specialists gave smokers exams every two months, and they saw that there was no adverse effects to their nose or throat, you know, and they really kind of featured doctors in a series of ads and even had taglines like more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And they showed doctors kind of in their everyday life, seeing patients at hospitals, answering calls in the middle of the night from their home and just really trying to drive home and shape this public opinion that cigarettes were not as harmful. And I think that probably um, that had a pretty big impact in terms of really shifting public perceptions. So that gave cigarettes a baseline reputation as a safe product, a reputable product. But then marketing shifted and started targeting, as you mentioned, different genders and ethnic groups. What was the impetus behind these marketing campaigns? Yeah, I think with, you know, any kind of product that you start to market, right, you try to market to the general population and then you try to think about, okay, what are some niche target markets that we need to reach and, and how do we reach those groups? I think the tobacco industry realized that they wanted to start targeting women and they, you know, really started to use themes that would resonate with women and like a stronger sense of independence, maybe kind of, you know, some of their concerns around body image. And so if you look at some of the, again, old ads that really kind of targeted women, they use themes like, you've come a long way, baby, the slimmest slim, you know, what else can I do but smile? And they really kind of like pictured women who were glamorous. Sometimes they were models or celebrities. And then they were run in magazines that women read. Similarly, the tobacco industry took a similar approach to targeting um, racial ethnic minority groups. So we know, again, from the industry document analysis that researchers have done, that they targeted the Black community, again, using Black models. There was also a heavy focus on cultural events, cultural identity, a big focus on music, kind of really linking and sponsoring jazz festivals. The cool brand also had promotions where they sponsored rap competitions. And a lot of this got a lot of attention from the public health community. And so they were able to try to kind of fire back and, and make that kind of more broadly aware to the public. But what you'll see is that the tobacco companies ran these ads more heavily in certain communities. So what you see is that there were more ads, more tobacco ads in stores in racial ethnic minority communities compared to white communities. And that overall, there were just more also tobacco retailers in racial ethnic minority communities. So what does that really mean? That means every time you go into a store, you're going to see more ads and then there's more stores in your community that sell tobacco products. And so it's not a surprise then that um, we see disparities in kind of the health outcomes related to tobacco use among racial ethnic minority groups. And one of the most pernicious tobacco marketing campaigns was its attention to youth smokers. What did they do there? Well, with youth smokers, I think there's a couple themes in this kind of arc of the history of where the tobacco industry started. If you look back into the ads of the early 50s, they used a lot of images of young people, whether it, it kind of has <laughs> themes of like high schools or university students where the models are shown like smoking or holding cigarettes, but they're in cap and gown or they're at a football game. And some of the ads even targeted specific universities, naming them in the ads and saying that, you know, Princeton voted our cigarettes the best compared to other companies. And so even kind of early on, there was this kind of attention 
to that like young group. And then I think what we saw kind of a little bit later on was them shifting to other themes. So they may not have tried to use young models, but some of those ads still kind of displayed activities that I think really resonated with younger audiences. So you would see models hanging out of the beach or playing together on a swing or playing football. And um, they use themes like break free or be a rebel. So as you can imagine, themes that really kind of resonate with younger audiences. And then probably one of the most egregious kind of campaigns that has been pretty well documented in the research literature is Joe Camel. So I'm sure you're familiar with Joe Camel. He was the cartoon character that Camel ran from like 1988 to 1997. And, you know, there was some really prominent research published in a Journal of American Medical Association that confirmed that kids, six-year-old kids, 91% of six-year-old kids were able to correctly identify the Joe Camel character with a picture of cigarette. And that level of being able to identify a cartoon character with a product was comparable to them being able to identify, for example, Mickey Mouse with Disney. So those are just some examples of, you know, how the tobacco industry really used marketing that appealed and targeted younger audiences. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1st, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. These were secrets that, once uncovered, would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Hey, I'm Mike Corey, the host of Wondery's Against the Odds. In our next season, I'm telling the story of a group of Chilean miners who are trapped half a mile underground when their mine collapses. At first, rescuers fear that the men were crushed to death under tons of rubble. Then, when they make contact with the miners, they must undertake a rescue operation unlike any other in mining history, one that will be watched by over one billion people around the world. This is the incredible story of how mine experts, rescue specialists, politicians, and even NASA teamed up to reunite 33 men with their families on the surface. Follow Against the Odds on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. So that's a, a survey of where the tobacco industry was. And then in the 90s, they had a reckoning. Of course, they didn't go away. The tobacco industry is with us today, but it has changed a bit. And it has a new product, e-cigarettes. It also has a new venue for advertising, social media. So first, what are e-cigarettes and vaping and how are they different from regular combustible cigarettes? Sure. E-cigarettes is such a fascinating new landscape because it's a product that's constantly changing. So it comes in many shapes and sizes. People may have know about it with different terms like e-cigs, e-hookahs, vape pens, mods, tanks. So in short, what makes e-cigs unique is that they mostly, uh, most of them have a battery component. They have a heating element and a place to hold the liquid. The e-cig works by heating a liquid, which usually contains like nicotine or other flavors, and it produces a vapor or aerosol, which the person then inhales. And so, so that is very different than a traditional cigarette, which you have to fire up. And by the act of kind of making it combustible, there's a lot more chemicals that gets produced when you're inhaling that combusted tobacco product. And that's been kind of the focus of why cigarettes are you know, so much more dangerous. So the e-cigarette marketplace has really kind of hit and taken off. And what we're seeing now as a result of it is that now among middle and high school students, they are more likely to use e-cigs than traditional cigarette products. What we see in terms of the stats is that like now about 27% of high school students and about 10% of middle school students report using e-cigs in the past 30 days. So we really see the shift. We've made tons of progress in reducing youth use of cigarette products with all these aggressive marketing campaigns and educational policies. But now kids are really have shifted to e-cigs. So we might have made progress in reducing nicotine use in traditional cigarettes, but it's been supplanted by e-cigarettes. Correct. What do we know about their health risks? Yeah, so I think the science about the health risk is evolving. So when e cigs first came to the market, they were marketed really kind of as an alternative to traditional cigarettes to help um, current smokers quit. And so I think the science around that would definitely suggest that it is healthier or um, better for a current smoker to shift to e-cigarettes completely and get off regular cigarettes. What has this concern now in the public health community is that people who've never used traditional cigarettes before are now picking up 
e-cigarettes. And so there, the, the concerns are similar in the sense that at the core, the main component of e-cigs is nicotine. And nicotine, we know from decades and decades of research that it's an addictive chemical. Um, it can be toxic at high concentrations. And we know that it's really harmful to brain development. So that's why there's such a heavy focus on adolescents and young adults, because the brain continues to develop into our mid-20s. And so if youth or young adults are using nicotine at an early age, that really can detrimentally affect their brain development. And similarly, we know that, you know, if nicotine is consumed in e-cigarette format or regular combustible cigarettes, it is also harmful to pregnant moms in terms of their health as well as their baby's health. But, you know, the long-term health consequences is still evolving and there's still a lot of research that is being done now and that we'll continue to pursue collectively because, as I said, it's, it's just an evolving product and there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the long-term consequences of e-cig use. So just as the product is evolving, I imagine the legislative landscape is evolving. How are they regulated versus regular tobacco? Yeah, so it's very interesting. So in 2009, Congress passed what's called the Tobacco Control Act. And what that did was that gave FDA regulatory authority to regulate cigarettes, smokeless, and roll your own tobacco. At the time, it wasn't inclusive of all tobacco products because, again, the product marketplace was changing. So I think one thing for you know people to really be aware of is that e-cigs is a relatively recent phenomenon in terms of kind of tobacco product category. And it wasn't really until 2016 when FDA's regulatory authority was then extended to also include authority over e-cigarettes, cigars, pipes, and as well hookahs. So there's, you know, the FDA, you know, what they can and can't do, you know, it continues to evolve. So they regulate certain things like products cannot be sold to persons under, you know, the legal age to purchase. They try to restrict marketing to kids. They, of course, oversee things like placing health warnings on product packages and ads, make sure that brands are not making claims about modified risk of their products. And then I think the big challenge they have is really trying to regulate the marketplace through what's called the pre-market tobacco product application. So companies, if they're selling tobacco products on the market, they need to register with the FDA and provide kind of the product listing, what kind of ingredients, you know, and any other kind of data and information they have there about their products. So this is, again, a pretty recent phenomenon, and it's something that's going to continually evolve. And I think you'll be seeing a lot of kind of just coverage around what happens with FDA now kind of at the center of having this regulatory authority. When we think about the marketplace, the other big challenge, Lindsay, here is that it's no longer the major tobacco companies. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we just had a handful of major tobacco companies who were players in the market. E-cigarettes really has just exploded. There was a study done by some researchers back in 2014 or 2015, and at the time, they noted that there was about 460 different e-cig brands and counting. So you can imagine just the challenge of trying to figure out what's in the marketplace, what those products contain, who's being exposed, where are they being sold, who's using it and what impact it's having on the public's health is an incredible challenge. And so I think that's been one of the biggest kind of thorns in this process of understanding the e-cigarette marketplace is that there's so many different players now. In addition to the, the new players, there's also a new landscape for marketing. How are e-cigarette and vaping companies using social media to sell their products? And how are these campaigns any different from the way cigarettes were marketed before 30 years ago? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. So I that's primarily why I do most of my research looking at social media, because I'm just fascinated by this landscape and the technology and the evolution of that. But then also just concerned about what does that mean as we move forward for public health? So traditional um, cigarette companies, they don't really have social media presence. Most of their activities online have been on a brand website, which you have to sign up and prove your age before you get access. It's really been the e-cigarette company and cigar companies to some extent that have really used social media to kind of promote their products. And I think the other thing that we need to talk about is what is advertising in the age of social media, right? And so, you know, if you use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever social media platform of your choice, you know that as you scroll through your feed, if you see an ad and it'll, it will tell you it's a promoted ad, right? So, you know, a promoted ad means that company paid to um, make sure their ad was placed in front of your eyeballs to get your attention. So the social media companies have been pretty responsive. So like, for example, Facebook has banned any advertisements, any paid advertisements on their platforms. Um, and several other companies have done the same. So tobacco companies and e companies can't pay for ads. So that's a good thing. However, they can still have public brand pages, right? And so what you're seeing now is essentially branded profile pages that's public where it's not regulated because it's where they can place posts related to new products. They can have information about, you know, where to buy. And then, you know, social 
social media working the way it does, you get a lot of engagement from your users and you get comments and you get testimonials. And so on some level, social media is this kind of like free marketing platform because it allows brands to talk about their products and engage a much broader audience without really ever having to pay a dollar for paid advertisements. So I think this is the challenge in the digital age. What counts as advertising and and, and what can we actually regulate? It seems as if tobacco remains a problem, even if it just changes its form. But in the 90s, when it faced its large legal reckoning and public exposure, there were large walls that could be knocked over. The revelations that came out that tobacco industries knew how dangerous their products were since the 60s or earlier was damaging. The legal repercussions were damaging. The settlement was huge. Today, there aren't those barriers to knock over. And as you mentioned, the players are smaller and more nimble in a media landscape that's completely different. Where is the fight against nicotine moving? I think there, the, so the marketplace is going to shift, right? And so if you think about this going forward, if you want to be able to sell electronic cigarette device, you're going to have to submit this, this pre-market tobacco application to FDA. It's called PMTA. And so by virtue of having that requirement in place, I think most folks who work in this space would argue that the marketplace and the players are going to winnow down. And then the other thing you need to think about is that the major tobacco companies, you know, RJ Reynolds, Altria that makes Marlboro, they have also gotten into the e-cigarette game, right? So RJR owns the brand Views, the brand Blue. And if you saw any of the news over the past couple of years, Altria acquired a 35% stake in Juul, which is by far one of the most popular brands that exploded into the scene. And so I think this story is going to evolve and it's going to be this kind of interplay between who the brands are and who the players are at the table and the regulatory authority of FDA, as well as um, what states are doing. You know, even in the Juul space, there are several lawsuits that states have filed against Juul. It will be interesting to kind of see what comes out of those litigation efforts going forward. In general, what are those litigation efforts against? What are they claiming? Largely, it has to do with targeting younger audiences with the marketing. And so that's at the core of some of those litigations. And as you know, Juul um, really kind of exploded. You know, as of 2019, it accounted for like 75% of the entire ENDS marketplace in terms of sales volume in the U.S. And I think some of the research that has come out has shown that Juul used tactics such as, you know, using younger models, promoting events, and really kind of using advertising tactics that research has shown definitely appeals to young younger audiences. You said earlier your focus and fascination was the use of social media by tobacco companies. If you think back to your own research, what have you discovered that perhaps the public needs to know most? I think one of the the thing to really note here is about the importance of of data. You know, as you know from your story that you've done around the tobacco industry, evidence and the importance of data played such a critical and crucial role in any of the litigation process, the master settlement agreement, which was, you know, a landmark settlement. And so building the science and the data around what's happening happening in the social media landscape, to me, is the biggest challenge. And it's it's definitely appropriate here in the context of tobacco marketing, but it's for any other product. So, you know, we're talking about tobacco and um, ends products today, but, you know, similar kinds of challenges can be said about understanding what's happening in the cannabis or CBD landscape. And the main issues there are a lot of the advertising and what's happening, we can't really see. So back in the days, if companies advertise in magazines or newspapers, things happened in the public view and there was some sort of documentation of it. With social media, you can hide hyper target to a very small niche audience because social media companies have built out very sophisticated targeting platforms for, you know, brands to target their ads to their audiences. And that's the kind of content we don't see. And then, you know, companies can have social media accounts and then they can delete them. And this is definitely what happened with Juul. They deleted their Instagram account. And so what does that mean in terms of the evidence base and the data to really be able to dig into what happened? And so I think as we move forward, not just for this particular topic, but as a society as a whole, we need to be really thoughtful and mindful about how we think about social media, the data behind that, and you know how we can move forward together more collectively to really help researchers and government agencies use that data in a way to protect the public's health. Anise Kim, thank you for talking to me today. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It was a pleasure to be here. That was Anise Kim, senior scientist at RTI International's Center for Health Policy Science and Tobacco Research. Next on American Scandal, Standard Oil was a monopoly unlike any in U.S. history. With its iron grip on the country's oil supply, it made John D. Rockefeller the richest American of all time. But Standard Oil also had a dark secret, one that a tenacious journalist would expose as she worked to take down the titan of industry. From Wondery, this is Episode 5 of Big Tobacco for American Skin. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review. Be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, The Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. 
Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey, wondery.com slash survey, to tell us what topics we might cover next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. Be sure to listen to my other podcasts too, American History Tellers and American Elections Wicked Game. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. This episode is produced by Audrey Noe and Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wonderland.